Great. Great. Well, thank you all for joining. Uh, we're going to give it about 35 seconds as people uh, log in uh, to the uh, Zoom account. Of course, uh, we'll also be joining uh, via uh, Facebook Live, Twitter Live, and YouTube Live. Usually during this time when people are joining, I talk about the COVID situation, which still is quite dire. We're at, um, sadly, uh, 942,000 deaths in the United States. And in the next two months, given the fact that the death rate from COVID is about 2,000 a day still, very, very high, um, we are going to pass the million mark. But today, of all days, we have to talk about the idea of using violence to resolve issues. With the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, you have uh, concerns that Russians have had, that Vladimir Putin, the Russian leader, has had, now metastasize into a full-blown invasion, war, death, bombing of, of, uh, of targets. And it's no different than uh, people in American civil society deciding that their concerns justify uh, violence as well. It's a criminal act. Uh, the question is what we can all do about it. And it seems like uh, the situation in Ukraine is so distant from us that uh, there's nothing we can do, but that's not true. We can talk about it. We can understand the circumstances that are uh, transpiring. We can gird ourselves for the pain that we will share as we respond and as we hang tough for a world civil society in which people talk and not shoot at each other. We can understand how we need to sacrifice in order to shape the world that we want to live in and that we want our children to have. And all of these issues are connected, respect for others, uh, issues of race, issues of poverty, uh, issues of civil society and how civil societies work. They're all connected. So by participating as you are, as participants in this program and as, uh, as active members of civil society, uh, you can actually create the change and then be prepared for further investment of time, treasure, effort, sweat, and tears to create the world that we want to live in. Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're talking about the importance of developing leadership diversity in art and cultural organizations and in universities with special guests, Aaron Dworkin, Professor of Arts Leadership and Entrepreneurship at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance at the University of Michigan, and founder of the Sphinx Organization, and Patrick Sims, Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost of the University of North Carolina School of the Arts and Founding Director of the Theater for Cultural and Social Awareness at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So Aaron, Patrick, I'm so happy to see you uh, here this morning and I, I'm very excited about this discussion. It's it's really long overdue, long intended as, as you both know. We're gonna start off by just sort of talking about why it's important and not just for moral and ethical reasons, but for the core business functions of arts and academic institutions that they actually debate what equality means and then take action, which might be imperfect, to change these institutions, change the art and how it is managed, how these institutions are managed to be more inclusive. So let's, say, let's set the stage a bit. Aaron, we're going to go to you. And then uh, Patrick, could you just talk a little bit about your careers, how you got to where you are uh, today? And then we're going to really delve into how do we create institutions that are resilient, that are sustainable, but also address the needs of, of all Americans and foster dialogue on, on issues of, of the day. Aaron, uh, let's just start with, with you. If you can give us a little bit of your career arc, it would be great. And then we'll go over to you, Patrick. Well, that sounds great. Thank you so much, Mark and, and Patrick. Uh, so wonderful to be able to, uh, to serve on the panel with you. 
Um, the and, and Mark, also, I just wanted to say thank you for your comments related to Ukraine, which is also very close to home. For those who may not know, I was adopted in my adoptive uh, family uh, originally came from Ukraine, uh, so that uh, is is very close to home. And my wife Afa, uh, who uh, grew up in Azerbaijan, uh, very close, has uh, also a lot of uh, friends and and family in Ukraine. So our our thoughts are are going out during an extraordinarily difficult time and and uh, challenges that they're facing. Um, and and to your question. Mark about, uh, you know, kind of my career arc, I would just add or say that to me, these issues of diversity, um, of inclusion, um, of equity are so important in the arts because the arts is that um, fabric that can knit us together. And literally, I absolutely believe and have seen throughout history, it can help prevent what we see happening in Ukraine today. We all have differences and these kind of quote unquote man-made walls that we build between each other, race, of geography, of nationality. But the arts has this unique ability to cut across those and to um, kind of demonstrate to each of us our shared humanity. But if all of our voices are not being heard and or being trained, prepared by our academic institutions, then this medium will not have that power, won't have that ability. So it goes so far beyond, well, is this good for the arts and so on and so forth. This really, I do believe these issues of equity in the arts and in our academic institution goes to the heart uh, of us as a society and especially a democratic society. So I'll be very kind of quick. Uh, the key thing I thought is that uh, to share about my arc is that the first part, I think because there was such a lack of, of equity and for me opportunity, I really ended up creating uh, my role. So I, I you know, I was uh, you know, born uh, and in some ways a violinist, I think, because I started when I was five and in all of these circumstances, uh, you know, was the only or one of a less than a handful of people of color. And ultimately that led me to while I was a student at the university. University of Michigan founding the Sphinx organization, looking at these issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and seeing that, that people really, it didn't seem to me, were doing at least something about it that affected me. And so I thought, well, what if we had this small idea and see if that could at least make a small difference? And an artist and entrepreneur, right? Yes, definitely, which I think is very important, especially in these issues relating to, to DE&I because we need to create new things. And sometimes that's a new organization like Sphinx, but also many times uh, it's leaders working within existing institutions, being entrepreneurial, starting new initiatives, empowering their organizations to evolve in a different way. Um, so ultimately- a role that, does, that doesn't exist, creating a space that didn't exist before. Yes, absolutely. And so after kind of, you know, years at Sphinx and doing that and my own kind of ongoing performing art, uh, then, uh, you know, kind of when your alma mater calls, uh, you definitely want to be able to respond. And uh, for me, I think it was a key time for Michigan and the School of Music, Theater and Dance and looking to begin these changes, you know, about six years ago, over six years ago. Um, and so took on that role as dean uh, of the school and looking to make some of these key changes. And, uh, and now then for the past several years as a faculty member in the entrepreneurial area of of our school that uh, didn't previously exist, but now uh, affects more than two thirds of our student body. And Patrick, I have a I have a bit of an, a, a, an advantage since we recruited you to uh, to uh, UNC School of the mm -hmm. Arts. Um, you also you also created space. You're also an artist and an entrepreneur, yeah. and an academic. Uh, you also have all these different paths, right? <laughs> yes. So, you know, it's funny, I'm, I'm listening and appreciating Aaron's journey. You know, I'm from originally the South Side of Chicago. So, you know, anybody who knows Chicago, you will know that there's a dynamic of Chicagoans that we always got a side hustle, right? There's always something else that you have going on because you never show the main thing that you're banking on is always going to be there. And I will say that is especially acute for folks who come from the African-American community or the Latinx community or any minoritized community, right? There is this sensibility of having this other theme that gives you a space to ensure that you can take care of your family and provide and so forth. My journey really began when uh, my mom made the decision to move me from the South side of Chicago, an area I grew up 
called the Racine Courts, was near Beverly Park area, uh, where she moved me from an all black neighborhood where I was one of many brown kids uh, to another area because of the violence and the gang violence in particular. I have two older brothers, so I was the youngest. Uh, and so she moved me to an area called Riverdale, Illinois. Uh, if you know the play A Raisin in the Sun, uh, the younger family moving to Clybourne Park, well, we were in some ways having a similar experience where we were the first black family on our block in our neighborhood. And our next door neighbor was the president of the Riverdale Improvement Association. And she told my mother point blank the day we moved in that we weren't welcome. No, I didn't know that at the time, but I, I was always struck by how different I was treated when I was in the quote unquote hood where I grew up, you know, and then we moved and I was about sixth grade or somewhere in there. And then I became one of only three black boys in the neighborhood. And so I was always fascinated about these questions about, man, why do people treat me differently? What's different about me? I hadn't changed, um, but I was always curious. And so that those questions stayed with me all throughout high school. And they stayed with me when I went to college. I too created a program there called the, um, ACE Theater Productions. It's the precursor to the organization I started when I was a professional, the Alliance for Cultural Evolution in Theater. That's what ACE stood for. When I got to um, be a professional working actor, director, writer, and so forth, and now someone who felt like I had a contribution to make in the education space, I created a program called the Theater for Cultural and Social Awareness, uh, which was a way to talk about these really thorny issues that everybody had opinions on, but nobody had a space to engage the conversation in a meaningful way. So we would sort of rip topics and situations from the headlines or the textbooks of our own lived experiences, create original material around those situations, and use that as a catalyst for the real conversation about how do we embrace difference? How do we celebrate and recognize what makes us us, but also what makes us different, right? And so that work uh, has always been about me trying to figure out why do we do what we do as human beings? And how might we find a way to engage each other in a more civil, respectful manner that, that acknowledges the similarities, because we're actually more alike than we are different, but it's not afraid to celebrate those differences either. So uh, that's the journey. And that's been the platform I've been on my, my career thus far. So much of your stories are about engaging in dialogue about the, the thing, right? Mm -hmm. And not avoiding the thing, right? Um, if, if we don't have a choice, Mark. <laughs> right. Right. Well, well, that's well, that's it. Right. So so the question is, do we not have a choice? Right. And how do you confront the idea of turning away versus mm -hmm. turning toward um, Aaron? You know, I, I'm going to ask you to comment on on uh, a situation that unfolded at um, at UNC, which is the the whole uh, debacle about the 69 project and uh, Nicole Hannah Jones's um, uh, tenure application, which was initially denied and then resuscitated, and she decided to go to Howard uh, University. It's it's a question of turning away from discomfort, right? You say, uh, Patrick, that uh, you don't have a choice. Do I have a choice? I mean, really, do I have a choice? I'm a white guy, right? Do I have a choice to turn away? Because it's always there. It's always there until I do, yeah. isn't it? I would say you do have a choice, but yeah. if you really want to engage society and really leverage the privileges that you carry and you care about these things, I think you will make a different choice, right? You have the choice to go either way. I'll speak for myself. I imagine, Aaron, to a certain extent, you, you, you probably have a different experience growing up uh, being an African-American or a person of color as you shared earlier, being raised and adopted by uh, white family members. I, I, I'm very curious about your journey, but I'll say, Mark, you, in fact, do actually have the choice. I, I hope you make the right choice <laughs> and one that is embracing uh, the difference. But it's that therein lies the rub. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I and I think I wouldn't necessarily um, carry so so I think, you know, we all always have choices, but I think the nature of circumstances and the nature of, of, of where we are at in our lives has such a huge impact. So, for example, um, you know, the, the situation that, that you mentioned, Mark, and kind of and, and kind of a, a, a turning away from discomfort. 
I what what I would kind of look at situations, and I try to do this as much as possible with other people's situations, especially relating to DE and I. Uh, when I was growing up in my early teens, a violinist, I was concertmaster of the Harrisburg Youth Symphony. So, and I was the only black member. Uh, and so I would get up in front of the orchestra at the beginning of rehearsal to tune the orchestra and the orchestra purposefully wouldn't be quiet, wouldn't quiet down, right? So I couldn't do and couldn't fulfill my role as concertmaster. This was deeply uh, destructive, uh, to use probably the word, uh, to me. I could have um, chosen uh, as a 14 year old, 13, 14 year old to just say, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm not going to deal with it and, and leave the orchestra. But I think if, if I would have done that, which I didn't at the time, and you asked me to describe it, I wouldn't have described that I turned away from discomfort, right? I probably would use all kinds of terrible words to describe all the people in the orchestra. And I would have been lashing out. And so for me at that time, as I reflect back, I had a choice, but if I look back, I'm like, I, I, I don't see, um, I could totally understand the decision that would be made to move away from conflict, uh, situations that at the time I felt there was nothing I could do about it. My personality was such already of kind of rebellion. And so I, the more that they did that, the more I wanted to quote unquote win and to, and to overcome what they were throwing at me. And I just simply loved my violin and the role with the orchestra too much, right? So to me, that kind of drove it more even probably than a sense of race because I would then go home to white parents and a white brother, I didn't fully, I think, even then grasp the racial component of it. To me, it was against Aaron. Um, so all of that to say that I think that the initiatives, the support systems, the structures, the mentorship that we develop in academic institutions, in our nonprofit cultural institutions is critically important to support people as youth or as adults who may feel like they're in impossible situations. And especially when we look at our tenure system and all of that and people who are on that track and on that path, I've seen terrible abuses uh, happen and occur that are related to race and to exactly what you just mentioned earlier, Mark, about speaking out and who have been punished for it and punished in ways that are very difficult to recover from in your career path. I think that, that what you're both saying is, is so very wise. There's not just one tactic. There's not just one overarching strategy that is the correct strategy. There are different approaches that people can take legitimately. You can turn away in, in, in your example, Aaron, that's a perfectly legitimate and invent, invent your own, invent your own venue, right? Um, turning away does not mean giving up. It just means spending your time in a different approach or you can engage. Um, and and um, I think that that um, if we look at the transformation of these institutions, these arts institutions, these academic institutions, there are uh, versions of these and other strategies that are employed. Let's talk a little bit about um, art and the idea of how do you create inclusive environments so that the dialogue that art fosters can go on, either in joy or in consternation. Uh, Patrick, when you're looking at the changes that you're bringing by your person, just by your presence at University of North Carolina School of the Arts, um, what do you believe are the attitudes that you as, a, as an executive leader within that uh, academic environment, in a very unusual uh, position for a Black man to, to uh, occupy based on, on the history of uh, academic institutions in North Carolina, what is what are the changes and the attitudes that you bring that that uh, position you to help the community evolve in a way that is productive for everyone? Well, I, I will say a couple of things. So first, um, it's eye opening for me in part because I was fortunate enough to have inhabited the role of chief diversity officer uh, at my last job. I was the the chief diversity officer and the deputy vice chancellor for diversity and inclusion at the University of Wisconsin Madison which is when you think about textbook PWIs, predominantly white institutions, Madison is one of them. Uh, interestingly enough, UNCSA, School of the Arts, it also is a PWI, right? So we are conservatory, uh, five amazing schools, but you know we are cut from very traditional costs in those regards. Uh, 
Uh, so in that sense, what I bring to bear is, is more informed by my understanding of the EDI conversation as a prior CDO for seven years, but also it's built on my lived experience as a young brown boy coming from the South Side of Chicago, uh, which I like to say is just the Northern suburb of Mississippi, right? So if you know anything about Chicago, that, that Northern migration is part of that process. Uh, so what I can share with folks is, all right, you talk a good game. I mean, we, we come in when I was being recruited for the role, I was struck by the phrase that many of the faculty talked about that they wanted to decolonize the curriculum. I said, well, that's, that's significant because if you're going to go back to the colonization component of this history, uh, you got to unearth a whole lot. So in my mind, uh, I, I am cautiously optimistic that people are committed to that, but I'm not entirely convinced they really know what that means. Right. I want to talk a little bit about decolonization because to me it has a particular meaning. I, I'd love for you to challenge my meaning if you think that it's that it's wrong. For sure. me, decolonization is not about um, uh, eliminating um, uh, the the um, the culture, um, any particular culture. It's about not having one culture overlaid on another culture. Right. In other words, it's it's about stopping the use of culture as a suppressive tool and instead opening the doors. Right. Well, I what, would so how, how do you I feel? would agree with you to a point. I, I would say what, what we're not taking into account was the active exclusion of African culture since yes. Africans first set foot on this continent. Well, exactly. So you can't talk about a layering or a, a, a delayering of culture when one culture was actively moved from the equation from the get-go and people literally lost their lives as a result of trying to preserve said culture. Now, right. we found ways to do that, but it's kind of like saying, hey, let's have this conversation. Let's just, can we all just get along? Um, it doesn't take into account the many practices. I don't need to go down the, the, the line, but you think about redlining. You think about active exclusion from economic opportunities. You think about Jim Crow. I mean, you, the history is littered with these kinds of instances where, but for the color of our skin, um, opportunities were explicitly denied from a certain group of people while actively exploited and multiplied for another group of people. So art was appropriated. Aaron, um, how do you see absolutely. the of decolonization? <laughs> well, and it's definitely a thing, you know, one of the things is that the, with DEI, it is complex, right? These things are just not simple issues. And you know, pre George Floyd, uh, and when I came in as dean at Michigan, and all of my you know meetings that I would have with so many orchestras, I would often be in a setting and say, "Oh well, you know, uh, uh, less than one percent of the works you're performing are by you know composers of color." And very typically, the response I would get from people who definitely would not consider themselves racist, nor in a, any stereotypical definition are racist. They don't live their lives in that way, um, but would and, and often consider themselves liberal, right? Uh, uh, would look and be like, like that, that's, that's, yeah, sure, we'd like to, but we're a major orchestra. We're a major, we don't do that. That that's not we, you know, we focus on the the really good music. Like that's nice, but that music doesn't exist. You know that, right? Come on, Aaron, right? That was a very um uh foundational viewpoint that wasn't coming from racism, I believe, because otherwise then I think it's very difficult to potentially shift it. It came from the fact that they were never taught it. All of the music and everything that they were exposed to growing up and then learning and getting advanced degrees never incorporated the exactly. music of Florence Price. Exactly. And so they're like, well, it just doesn't exist. Now, post George Floyd, so to kind of go back to your original uh, question about that, Mark, I would say that when I was looking at those things, I was like, yes, we actually have to change that culture. There is yeah. a culture that the music I was trained in is the level of excellence music that we should have, the music I learned about. And if it isn't part of that portfolio, it's really not part of this art form, right? That culture has, I, has shifted more in the past year and a half to two years than I've ever seen it shift in yeah. my life. So, 
Aaron, if I could jump in on that, I mean, one of the things, just to give you, Mark, a, a very concrete example for us, I mean, that is the space we're literally in right now at UNCSA is we are trying to wrestle with the kind of active exclusion of works by and informed by the lived experiences of people of color or BIPOC individuals. Uh, we know that there's a lot of rich history and relationship of some of the, the sort of European or white artists that we celebrate in the music world that were inspired by African or African-American artists, right? And so we celebrate that, but we don't celebrate the origin of their inspiration. Uh, but what, what I did this year uh, when I saw that we were gonna have a first major black opera at the New York Met with fire shut up in my bones, I, in my subversive way, I said, you know what? I, I gotta see if we can produce that. So I wanted to bring the, our Dean of Dance because the choreographer Camille A. Brown is alum of UNCSA. She's the co-director of that project. And our Dean of the School of Music, a uh, phenomenal gentleman, uh, Saxon Rose, shout out to him and Endelin Taylor, Dean of Dance. And I said, hey, why don't we just go check out the show and see what it would take for us to produce it, right? So I wanted to be ambitious. Like, how do you put UNCS on the map? And, and as, a, as a gesture to sort of create camaraderie and, and team building as, as the provost, I said, well, let's, let's invite all of the, the deans. I didn't think they were all going to come, but they all, they all said yes. I was like, oh, crap. I got to find a way to pay for this now. <laughs> but much to my surprise and much to my great enthusiasm, we all went as a group. And when we sat in that audience and we saw that show and we saw what Camille A. Brown was doing and what Terrence Blanchard was doing, I was just like, y'all, this is history in the making. And we need to insert ourselves in this because our prodigy, our lineage is part of this. And we should submit that as part of who we are moving forward, that this is the kind of work that you and CSA will be known for in the future. And, um, and, and you're basically both speaking to the reason why um, having deciders who have these different perspectives, yeah, art perspectives, is so critical to having art institutions that thrive. Because yes. when you exclude the, when you create a definition, as you said, Aaron, not out of a sense of of racism, but a sense of familiarity, but but in this benign neglect of of a whole art form and artists and and groups of people, women, you know, women painters or or, or uh, black um, librettists for opera or um, Latin Hispanic. Um, dancers um, at San Francisco uh, Ballet just just hired a wonderful artistic director um, out of Spain. Um, you you end up with a tilted scene and you deprive people of great art. So deciders having deciders who are who are part of this is is really an important part. And eighty seven percent of the respondents to our last poll um, um, uh, agreed with that. Now, we're asking a poll right now, which I'm really interested in seeing what the answers are. We, we asked, what are the two biggest barriers to hiring deciders of color or other, other marginalized group in academic and art institutions? And uh, Patrick, since you've gone through, uh, through that process, um, what do you feel are, are, are those barriers? And, and Aaron, you've also seen it from your side. So after Patrick answers, could you just sure. weigh in? What, are, what do you think the barriers are? Because Nobody comes into those search committees, and I can attest to that, having run so many of them. Nobody comes in and says, we don't want, you know, a trans uh, right. person, okay? Yeah. They don't say that. But then the, the process unfolds, and it becomes much more difficult as the process yeah. unfolds. Uh, what do you see the, the biggest barrier, Patrick? And then Aaron. Yeah, so first and foremost, I, I think you got to, you know, be clear about what you want as the outcome. I think sometimes we get caught up in the hype of appearing to do the thing than actually doing the thing that gets to the outcome that you want. So box if you're checking, clear, right? box checking, this is not about box checking, right? Exactly. You got to be clear about what the outcome is and be clear about what the effort's going to take to get said outcome. So, for example... If you want to ensure that you have a diverse leadership team, I, I, I just hired three. One of the first things I did my first year in the job, I had to hire three new deans. I have seven deans. So nearly half of my team, I had to hire the first year and I'm hiring the fourth one this year now. I made very clear my expectation that I wanted to see 
people from uh, historically marginalized or in this country underrepresented communities as part of that finalist pool. Being a CDO, I know you can target your recruitment efforts. You can target certain communities, certain constituents and demographic audiences. I was very clear. I want to know where you're going, who you're asking, and who you're talking to. Build your network. That was first and foremost. You can get people to the door, but you may not always get them to walk through it because what they are going to look at, and this was something I did, is what am I walking into? Like, am I jumping from the frying pan to the fire? Or am I walking into an environment where the leadership is acknowledging the kind of challenges that I'm going to face as a person of color stepping into the situation? So it's not a situation where I have to constantly coach up and coach out, but that there's an ally, an active ally that is mindful of and willing to make the tough decisions to say, no, we're going in this direction as opposed to what we've done in the past. Aaron, could you jump in here? And and what is your take on this this issue? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of really key things when we look at these processes in some ways pragmatic. First, I kind of refer to it as the small pool. Uh, No matter what, with almost all the searches that I've seen and been involved with, you end up with a search committee as a small group of people that they're actually going to invite. Typically, the majority of that group are people who are known by the people on the search committee, especially in academic roles. So if historically we have no African-Americans or or fewer people of color in these roles, then these search committees typically do not know people of color. Uh, It's just (laughs) that simple. And so unless they shift that opinion, that process, which is not like racially based in an intentional way, it's just this is what I know, it's what I'm most comfortable with, it's what I think will be best for our school, et cetera. So that's one and affects the small pool. That was something we were beginning to do initially, first and foremost, when I came to Michigan. Then second is once you have that pool and that pool is diversified, um, it's actually, and this is also part of that process, is to me looking at resume. Um, so if we have a historical situation where people of color are have been um, either you know, not permitted or, or for any of the host of reasons that have happened historically, not um, been able to follow the traditional career trajectory, then it's looking and saying, what are the skill sets that we ultimately want in this role? Does this person have them? And do they potentially have an atypical path that led them there? I can speak very personally to this because I was a highly <laughs> atypical candidate for a deanship, right? Didn't have the typical tenure professor, assistant, associate dean somewhere, and then you know smaller school to bigger school, et cetera. Definitely not. I was in the quote unquote private sector. Uh, all the way up until that appointment. And so, but the search committee looking in a very forward way and thinking about what they wanted and needed for the school looked at those skill sets that I, you know, possess. And then the very last thing that I'll say is the, the culture and style. So in other words, a lot of times then when they're sitting with that final group and interviewing without necessarily consciously saying it, they're like, so are this, is this person going to be able to talk to all of the components of our school and stuff like that? And if someone is engaging with someone who doesn't necessarily talk like they do or their friends do when they go home and, and uses different language and different inflections and voice inflections, now we're really talking about cultural change. What I often share with people and I say with an orchestra, I say, okay, take this orchestra. Uh, we'll just say, you know, X big, big city orchestra. And I said, if 70% of that orchestra was black, it would play differently. When they're in rehearsal, it would sound differently. The conversations that happen in the rehearsal room, in the break room would be different and they would yeah. sound different. And that's a cultural shift that a lot of people are uncomfortable with. Well, let me speak to that. If I can jump on that for a second, Mark, because it's, it's the final point I wanted to make earlier. You know, you, you get into the door, you, you have the committee that's looking for them, right? You have the individual walking through the door and saying, hey, can someone support me while I'm here? The next part of that process is critical mass, right? So how you build out the critical mass that says, oh, there are people who understand me, who understand my lived experiences, and that I can probably relate to them in addition to being fellow artists, but we may have similar lived experience. We may be in the same fraternity. Uh, we may have family from similar states. You know, I, I, I say Chicago, northern suburb of Mississippi, you'd be hard pressed to run into somebody black. You don't have folk from Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia. You know, you have these other ways of engaging. 
So once you create that critical mass, the status quo or the majority, the historical majority has to be responsive to said critical mass because you don't want to bring these new voices in the mix and then expect them to assimilate. You have to bring them in the mix to incorporate, hear that feedback and right. create the kind of decision making that moves the organization forward that also sends a very clear signal that we are taking these things seriously. And so that's the journey I'm pleased to say that we're on at UNCSA. Um, you know, when I walked in, no diss to the white brothers in the room, you, Mark, or anyone else, but I had seven white men who were all of my deans, right? I now have uh, four women, four women, three of them are women of color. That did not happen and probably wouldn't have happened if I weren't in the CETAS provost. And, and the thing that, that I think is, is really important, and by the way, Jacqueline uh, Dace uh, asked, um, when will the arts community be intentional making these decisions or do we just keep talking about it? What you're, t what you're saying, uh, Patrick, what you're saying, Karen, and hopefully the way we function is that you can actually look at the results that people deliver and create a contextualized analysis of leadership and accomplishment and art, which allows us to evaluate candidates against each other who have different backgrounds, might not have the standard career path, but somebody who has created great art and been a great art educator that doesn't come out of a, out of a uh, standard career pedigree, you can analyze that person by their results right next to somebody who does come out of a standard career pedigree. And the results are the thing that drives the analysis and not the pedigree. Yeah, and can I just share one thing uh, to add on to that, Mark, is that people often these issues and some of the opposition to DNI is again, it's not racial, it's often fear-based. So for example, I know uh, coming into my role, one of the key questions I needed to answer during the search process and I could see was a concern was, does he understand tenure? Right. Does he understand and get it right? So if he hasn't been part of that, of course, I did, you know, because I really had been involved with a lot of academia, just not in a traditional way. Um, but so but that was a, a very significant and I would say legitimate fear. Right. Of people saying, OK, if we have a new leader come in, what are these things going to happen? Here are things that we you know, know about, does this person, et cetera. And so it's looking, and I would say when bringing about these change and I look at a system, I'm like, who are the constituents? Um, what are their concerns and what are their fears? What are, what, as I look at that and do listening tours, what are the fears that are um, legitimate, um, foundational and which are more surfacey or unimportant as it relates to the institution? And then how do you go about addressing those fears? And what I find can be very empowering is that some of the people who might initially be very oppositional, when you actually really have some authentic conversations and address those fears, they can sometimes become some of the strongest champions of the change. Well, uh, we've gone 10 minutes over our time already and we could go for another hour. Um, so uh, we're going to have to bring this to a close. Patrick, I'm going to give you the last word, but um, I would love, to, you know, maybe uh, three, four months to come back again and continue the conversation because this thing is not over. It will never be over, of course, but uh, we have so much more to to talk about. Uh, Patrick, yeah. can you take us out? If, if you were going to tell me how to change, to make me better at embracing this incredible world that is beyond my comprehension, because your sensibility is not necessarily mine. Your mm -hmm. lived experience, Aaron, is not necessarily mine. But I'd love to have the advantage of being informed by, by both of you. How, how should I change? How should I evolve myself in, in terms of, of creating an America that, that is so amazingly wonderful and and diverse yeah. and, and interesting and, and exciting for my kids. Right. Well, so, A, first of all, I would never try to tell you how to change, right? But <laughs> that, that's a very personal journey, right? It, religion and politics, right? Two things I don't really talk about that much. But to the extent you are willing to be open and be wrong, I think I love your last comment, Aaron, that a lot of some of the shift and challenges that we're up against isn't always about racialized or internalized racism. I think some of that may be there, but often there are other 
issues at play and fear of being chief among them, right? Fear, not because the person's black, but just fear like, oh, you gonna mess with my world, right? And so recognizing that the worst case scenario is not as bad as you think it will be, right? That there is room for improvement where you can live your full authentic self as Mark Oppenheim, a white guy. I can live my full self as Patrick Sims, a black guy who happen to have some mutual interest around social justice, and we're gonna support each other in that journey. So I'm not gonna beat you up for being white. You're not gonna be mad at me for the moment, the zeitgeist moment that African-Americans and black people and Latinx communities are experiencing right now, that it, it, it's our time to shop, right? When, when you mentioned George Floyd and those kinds of challenges, I mean, I, I would be hard pressed to, talk about experiences that I had or other young African-American men who grew up in the South Side of Chicago who didn't have similar or knew of similar stories that didn't get the light of day that George Floyd situation did, right? So that was like, yeah, tell me something I don't know, right? Now it's a different dynamic where I'm saying, do you believe me, right? You can't refute the ocular proof. Do you believe me that this has been our experience? So I think acknowledging that there's room for growth and it's not about naming, shaming or blaming. If you can embrace that and be willing to take that very uncomfortable journey and be ready for the pushback and criticism, because there will be folks who will say, screw you, you're a white guy, and won't have nothing to do with you. Uh, but more often than not, I think once people get past that initial frustration or angst, uh, there's a genuine conversation that can happen. If you're willing to hang in there till you get to that genuine conversation and listen, Right. One of my mentors always says folks with power need to speak first and listen longest. If you can do those things, you're on a road to success as far as I'm concerned. I love that. And I love your point and a point that you also uh, made, Aaron. We have to be OK and relaxed about sometimes being wrong and being informed by people who are smarter than us in different ways. Aaron Dvorkin, professor of arts, leadership and entrepreneurship at the School of Music theater and dance at the University of Michigan and founder of the Sphinx organization, Patrick Sims, executive vice chancellor and provost of the University of North Carolina School of the Arts and founding director of the Theater for Cultural and Social Awareness at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Let's do this again. This has been so great. Hey, I had a schedule for an hour, man. I was ready to go. I thought we still had more time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all. Stay safe and uh, and let's all um, uh, uh, pray for, for those who are... Um, uh, undergoing uh, violence in all of its forms and uh, do our part to ameliorate that. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you so much, much for your invitation. Thank you for having me. Patrick. Good Thank meeting you, Aaron. Hey, we had Sphinx here on campus last, last semester. We're going to bring them yes, back. Yes, absolutely. It's <laughs> awesome. A <laughs> little bit of a pitch. There we go. There we go.